like to thank you on behalf of the Edward Farrar Utility District for you to coming out this evening for our second informational meeting on the proposal for housing at 51 South Main Street. Um, we're going to be responding to questions that we heard at the last meeting, other questions um, that have been posted on the internet and things, and uh, um, we'll be presenting that to you uh, tonight. And this is a, a draft, I mean, the agenda we'll be following. I'd like to introduce uh, Teresa Wood. Probably most of you know her, but she's going to be the uh, moderator for the evening and uh, go over the ground rules with us. So. We'll swap the mic here and get started. Oops, wrong way. Okay, thank you, Skip. Appreciate it. First off, I'd just like to uh, welcome everyone here this evening. And um, we do have a, a few ground rules just to make sure we're all operating from the same point of, um, point of view. And hopefully everybody can agree to them. Um, so uh, the first one is to be respectful of each other. And you might not agree with what somebody says, but um, if we can respect that that's that person's opinion and uh, move on in a respectful way. Um, it will be very helpful. This um, meeting is being recorded by ORCA. Uh, and to only have one person speaking at a time. Um, if you could state your name and location, you don't have to give your address, but if you live in the district, that's helpful, or if you don't live in the district, that's helpful to know. Um, to please mute your cell phones, put them on vibrate. If you need to take a call or you have an emergency or something, if you wouldn't mind stepping um, just outside, that would be wonderful if you need to take a call. Um, ask for clarification. So after um, each presenter gets done with their information, there'll be an opportunity for um, questions after each presenter uh, or asking for clarification. So if you don't understand something that the presenter has just said or you uh, would like a bit more information to make sure you have a clear understanding, please, please feel free to ask for clarification. And um, I should check, uh, it, are people able to hear me in the back? You okay? Okay. Um, and then disagreeing is fine, but let's not be disagreeable. Um, so if we can be polite to one another and have a civil meeting, I think everybody will be bell, uh, well served by that. And then please don't interrupt when people are speaking. Um, let them have the floor and then I will recognize uh, people when they have their hand up um, to be able to speak after that. So I uh, appreciate everybody being here tonight and um, I am going to be timing folks, so don't be alarmed uh, if you're a speaker <laughs> uh, when I give you like a, a two minute warning just to let you know um, because we, there's a lot of folks going to be speak, speaking tonight and we want to make sure that there's time for questions and answers as well. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn this back over uh, to Skip to review the agenda and be the first presenter. Uh, thank you. Too. I won't start your timer until after you've got the microphone hooked up. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, as you can see up on the screen, the agenda for the evening, it's pretty much like we did at the first one with a couple of additions. We're going to talk about the update on the parking uh, study that we did in 2016. And uh, at the back, we have the uh, utility district Kurt clerk and Lou Schlegel of the Board of Civil Authority are going to be speaking about the voter registration and the voting that will go on on Monday. So um, with that, um, I'm going to do a brief history of uh, what the uh, former village trustees and now commissioners have done with regard to uh, trying to find a use for uh, the lot at 51 South Main Street ever since Irene uh, came through Waterbury there. So, well, well that's coming up. Um, there is a signing sh sheet I'm going to pass around here. This is an officially warned meeting of the district, so 
it'd be helpful if you could uh, sign in and uh, if you wouldn't mind just passing that around, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. Is that? Oh, it went away. Okay. Like I said, this is a brief history of the lot. Um, the village purchased it in 1983 from the uh, Rusty Parker Estate for 74000 and modified it into the vault and the police station. Um, and then when Irene came through, it was not only damaged by the flood water, but the biggest damage that occurred to it was from the oil tank tipping over and uh, contaminated all the floor beams and uh, everything. Um, and then when we uh, looked at it, the building as it was, we had sort of outlived its use as a municipal office uh, due to space and things. So it wasn't in uh, contention to be renovated and returned to use as a municipal office. And uh, when we got the estimate to put the building back into uh, use as it was, it was a $435,000 um, to restore the building. So that gave us cause for uh, thinking about what we would do with a lot and things. So um, this is the uh, engineer's uh, estimate to restore the building to $435,844 there. Um, and we did that in 2012. We've gone through a number of RFPs as we were deciding what to do with the lot. This is one of the first ones in 2013. Um, did an RFP that could have included uh, subdividing the lot that we wanted. The back part could be used for private or municipal parking with a right of way and a proposal for uh, you know, the front part to possibly reuse the building. We got two responses to that RFP. Um, the first was for $90,000 um, to take down the building and use it as a pay for parking lot. Another proposal was going to offer us $10 for the property. And he proposed to take the building down and build a parking garage with uh, office space and things over the top of it. And he was hoping that we would uh, lease the property back and put the municipal office and the fire station in there. Uh, it would have 10, 6 to 12 residential units in that building. Um, a third proposal that uh, working with the economic development director, Darren Winham, he was seeking uh, letters of interest of people. And uh, Dan Johnson was one of the people. And, uh, we worked with him through Darren, and uh, he offered us $30,000 for the lot. At the time, we were looking to increase the village grand list because it had been depressed due to the damage from Irene. So um, he offered uh, the 30 and was proposing to build a housing unit that had uh, 31 bedroom units, things on it. Uh, that proposal was presented to the village voters and uh, voted down at the time. Then um, with the uh, estimate to repair the building of the $435,000, the insurance company offers the village a percentage of that uh, cost to repair it if you want to take the cash instead of repairing the building. The uh, trustees voted to accept $348,000 for the building and not repair it. Um, so we took that money. It's been invested in things. We then uh, asked for RFPs for the lot again in 2017. We got three proposals. Um, we were in discussion with each of them, but none of them turned out to be uh, acceptable there. And in all the terms. In 2018, we agreed to, uh, with these construction works, to take the building down. They specialize in restoring, uh, reusing, recycling all the metals and wood from the building. So they took the building down and we built a parking lot um, that you see there today for uh, $73,982 for uh, 
taking the building down in the parking lot. And we used uh, part of the parking study we'll hear about later was where we studied the parking in the downtown to determine what to do with the lot. Did we need the parking? Was it critical? And there was a recommendation that we would use that lot during Main Street reconstruction to help offset the on-street parking spaces that are going to be lost during, uh, during construction. Um, the Main Street uh, construction was completed in 2021, and that's when we uh, looked at expressing an interest of what to do with 51 South Main Street. We knew of the town plan that said the critical priority need was housing, affordable housing. We asked the manager to reach out to Down Street, who uh, has affordable apartments in the village uh, and in the town, if they were interested in the lot. Um, they said they were. Um, this is the lot. It's about eight-tenths of an acre. And uh, the appraised value uh, on the grand list is $135,000. And if approved, the article that we'll be voting on on the uh, 24th, it would be sold for $138,000. I don't know where the difference between the 135 and the 138 in there, but somewhere it crept in there. Um, and the commissioners in making this decision to bring this to the voters and talk to Down Street thought that given the history of this lot and municipal service to the community um, that we would look for a use that helped meet one of the priority needs in our town plan. The commissioners are responsible for the care of the district property and bringing proposals to the voters of which we're doing um, today. And we were interested in uh, like I said, an option for affordable housing, market rate housing. Um, we hear about the stories, how expensive it is in apartments being bought and uh, renovated and uh, converted into uh, high rents and things. And Down Street is one of the few organizations that offers the uh, affordable housing where the rents are factor into the amount of income. Um, and if this project is going to potentially write, uh, result in a financial gain to the utility district of 348000 we got from the insurance. We spent 73000 to destruct the building and build the parking lot. And the sale of the property, the 138000 So the net gain to the utility district from doing this will be $412,000. Um, some of it has been invested, and if we sell it, that would likely be invested in too. So that's the history that brought us here today with this proposal that we've uh, presented at the last informational meeting. You're going to be hearing more information about it uh, in a few minutes. Great. So. Thank you so much, Skip. Did I get under my time? You're good, you're good. You still have two minutes and 10 seconds for additional <laughs> wow. questions and thoughts. Okay. That was awesome. So um, is there anyone who has any questions or um, questions of clarification or anything about Skip's presentation about sort of the history uh, from 2011 to uh, 2022 and where we are at right now? Anybody have any questions? Just feel free to raise your hand. I have one. Yes. Um, you mentioned the one that was the proposals that were rejected. By the there were also other proposals. Uh, can you explain why they were rejected? The either the trustee. Uh, they were all the trustees because this is the first proposal as the uh, commissioner. Either weren't fair to the village, or we didn't like what was proposed, or didn't believe they could do it, mm -hmm. or we couldn't agree on a price. Okay. One of them. So there were multiple factors, okay. but we didn't think it was anything we'd want to bring to the village. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or thoughts about this part of the presentation? Great. Thank you, Skip. I'm ready to hand off. You're ready to hand off to Katie Gallagher. 
We even have like 45 Thank seconds you. for mic handoff. You know, oh, wow. I, that's that's <laughs> like you think you might have done this Got a time or two or anything. Well, I'll probably talk for too long. <laughs> Not really, because I've got the clock. That's good. That's really helpful. <laughs> Thank you. I'll sell yeah. you a couple minutes. Yeah. <laughs> How All much? Right, Shady, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, while she's getting that up, my name is Katie Gallagher, and I am the vice chair currently of the Planning Commission. And I live in Waterbury Center, so I'm not a, a voting member of the district, but I live right next to the um, Downstreet Project uh, housing in, in Waterbury Center. Um, but I'm going to talk today about um, how housing relates to and how this project specifically relates to our town plan um, and the Waterbury Planning Commission's work related to housing in the village area. Um, so also, for those of you who are at the first meeting, this might look pretty familiar because I stole a lot of it from Alyssa, so thank you to Alyssa. Uh, but starting off, just background planning for Waterbury. Um, I want to point out um, there's this definition of what planning allows a community to do, but what I think is really important here is the fact that we are thinking about, as a planning commission, where it is that we would like to be headed as a community, recognizing that change is coming, change is inevitable. Um, and working together to figure out how we're actually going to get there. So I think it's just remember, um, important to, to remember and, and keep in mind that we all love Waterbury. It's not always going to be exactly the way that it is today, but how can we best manage that change that's coming at us? Um, so Waterbury's Planning Commission um, has discussed this project, and we support the sale um, of 51 South Main Street to Down Street. Um, primarily because of Waterbury's town plan. So that's the most recent town plan in 2018, but also previous plans that have um, uh, included housing and, and mentioned specifically this type of work for the village. Um, our current zoning regulations and plans for the future, um, our, our understanding of current housing needs and how that relates to land use and planning, um, and the development process of this kind of work moving forward. So I'm going to focus mostly on the relationship to the town plan, but wanted to just highlight that these are the four kind of components that as a planning commission we felt like supported um, this decision. So this is, for those of you who are not familiar, Waterbury Town Plan, beautiful front page. Um, this link up here is where you can find it. You can just go to our site and find it here. This is the 2018 town plan. And the two relevant sections here are chapter five in housing and chapter 11 in land use. So starting um, uh, with housing, actually this, uh, I pulled it out from, um, I think it might've been the 2013 survey. Um, so, you know, as a reminder, town plans are created, um, co-created with community members through surveys and community input and feedback. Um, this survey asked what would be the most effective steps Waterbury could take to manage future residential growth. And these are the top two answers, and I'm sure those of you in the back cannot read this, uh, but the top two answers were allowing high density housing at the state office complex property, and the second was allowing multifamily housing in a larger portion of the village. And in response to the question, where should Waterbury encourage more residential development, the majority of respondents supported housing to be located within the village. Um, so chapter five, housing, these are just two of the goals, um, but related to this discussion, the first is ensuring the availability of safe, decent, and affordable housing for all current and future Waterbury residents. And the second is creating new housing in locations that maintain the integrity of neighborhoods while increasing density, respecting the natural environment, and minimizing the need for infrastructure improvements. And of course, um, the village is, has, um, municipal water and, and sewer. So getting more specific um, into objectives that are listed in this section of the town plan, the first, encouraging development of affordable housing. Um, again, near employment, public transportation, this is an area that's served by infrastructure but also provides residents with access to um, education, health services, um, all the needs, uh, or most of the needs that you need to be fulfilled uh, to live a, a high quality of life. 
Um, the second here, uh, encouraging the creation of more diverse housing, so housing that fits the needs of, of all of us, and particularly looking at accommodating smaller household size, sizes, which we know um, is an increasing trend for people looking for housing for younger families, younger workers, older folks who are looking to downsize, people who are looking for smaller units for the cost benefit, so on and so forth. The sixth objective, um, supporting housing that maximizes development potential, minimizes environmental impacts, preserves open space, and ensuring uh, greater efficiency in infrastructure. Um, and we're gonna come back to this, but a lot of the points here are, are kind of what we think about when we talk about smart growth. So making sure that we are incentivizing development in our existing downtowns and village centers where we've already invested our municipal dollars um, and allowing that uh, to have us protect our, our farms, our forests, our, our working landscape. The seventh point is encouraging public-private partnerships to, de to develop housing options. Um, and so that is, again, what we're talking about today. And then two actions related to this uh, housing chapter. One is uh, exploring the expansion and infill of the village growth centers, allowing how higher density residential and mixed uses that include housing, and encouraging partnerships with nonprofit agencies such as Downstreet and others to provide assistance with financing affordable housing projects. Um, so going on to our land use goals, uh, Waterbury as a town for many years has had this goal that's also encouraged by Vermont's municipal and regional planning and development law and policies, which is to guide future growth and development by reinforcing Waterbury's traditional pattern of concentrated settlements surrounded by rural countryside. So that's what I was referencing before related to this idea of smart growth. Um, but what that looks like here is, is again, higher density residential development in Waterbury Village. And I just want to note also that, um, again, there are multiple benefits to this kind of land use pattern. It's not, it's, it is about providing housing for uh, everybody in the way that meets their needs, but it's also uh, provides a benefit to the town. It provides benefits to our environment. It provides benefits to our local economy, so on and so forth. So um, a goal that we have for our land use um, specifically related to the growth center, which is we're talking here about the growth center in uh, Waterbury Village, is to ensure that new development and redevelopment is compatible with existing uses, adheres to smart growth planning principles, respects the integrity of historic structures, and enhances existing development. And so I just want to note as well in relation to some of the concerns that we've had um, that that the fact that this is in our historic downtown is still critically important when we're talking about new development and making sure that we don't want to have something that's that's totally out of place in our community and that is something that the planning commission um, is also focused on so two objectives here again similar to the housing chapter is to promote a variety of mixed uses and higher density development and encouraging new development in this place that we're talking about. Um, just to mention also in the town plan, conserving energy through density of land use. So same kind of ideas, just other benefits of this type of land use and leveraging public infrastructure investments. So again, we've already put our public dollars into this space. So to take advantage of, this is, this is a important way to take advantage of, of that existing investment. Um, so Alyssa's gonna talk about zoning a little bit more in a second, so I'm just gonna touch on this. Um, but this is a map of Waterbury's designated downtown. The blue star is the location of 51 South Main. Um, Waterbury has this designated downtown. It is um, a process that allows us to support community revitalization while preserving the historic character um, of the town and enhancing um, our the future of our center. Uh, this is a map of our the future housing distribution maps um, that you can find uh, with the town plan related documents. Um, not going to go into all of this, but that blue arrow, this is where we're talking about the housing project. This is in um, 
in red, this area is what we're talking about in terms of where we want um, future growth. And as you can see, you probably cannot see because it's way too small, but on the right hand side, um, this is noting the number of units that we are um, planning for in this in the different districts in this in this area. And I also just want to highlight this is not a whole map of Waterbury. This is I didn't change the extent of this at all, but we're talking about we need more housing in this growth center here and all of the rest of the town is kind of, you know, where we're not trying to build more. So just, you know, keeping in, in mind that broader context of, you know, while we're having this very specific conversation about this very specific location, um, the goal is that we are, are protecting and preserving our working and natural lands in the rest of the town. Thank you. Almost done. Okay. So um, again, we have a specific downtown zoning district that allows for higher density housing in our mixed use core. Um, related to housing needs, again, just going back to that question I posed in the beginning of where we want to be headed and how we can get there. We know that we need homes for everyone in our community. And this is how we get there. Um, so again, it's not just about it is, again, it is about providing housing for people, but what housing gets us is teachers, is the people who serve me pizza when I am too tired to make dinner. You know, it's my, my dentist and all of these people who need housing and we need to help support. Um, this is my final slide. Just want to know, also, Alyssa is going to talk about it more, um, but we as a town have several, uh, you know, parts of a process uh, that encourage public comment. And I would encourage you all to engage in that public comment process. We already have our town plan, so you, you I'm sure, all engaged in that process. Uh, we're you know, redoing our zoning and bylaws right now. This project would still have to go through a DRB review. So here's our website, and um, I will we'll leave it there. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Katie. Um, so Katie just covered an immense amount of information in a really short time. And um, I do want to encourage people to take a closer look at this at the website. And we'll stop here for a second. Um, and uh, I just want to uh, allow a, just a, a minute or two if anybody has any specific questions that Katie might be able to answer this evening about um, any clarification any uh, information that you didn't understand or uh, any any other information or questions about her presentation. Don't be shy. Yeah, go ahead. Um, the downtown has a lot of floodplain in mm -hmm. it. So are you increasing the density in the areas of the floodplain as well? Um, Alyssa might be able to answer this question better than, than I can, but I believe that the area of density is outside of the, the Floodplain areas. Mm -hmm. Alyssa Johnson, I'll introduce myself in a minute, but used to be chair of the Planning Commission. I would say we do, there's a conundrum. Most of downtown Waterbury, where we have dense development, is a floodplain. I would note one section of our regulations that aren't in any of these presentations, but we do have special flood hazard area regulations that are made to address the fact that flooding happens and make a community more resilient. So that's been something the Planning Commission has tried to balance, having those regulations that support more resilient communities and allow density in a way that is more resilient to potential flooding, recognizing that it happens. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Alyssa. Thank you. One more question, if there is out there. And I just saw it. Um, if there, there are um, masks available here, if anybody um, would like to use them, you are welcome to get up and avail yourself of them if you would like to. Um, and there's also information on the table over here about the upcoming vote and some other information there about um, fees um, for the utility district um, for this property. So feel free to take one on your, on your way out. Thanks so much, Katie. Um, we're gonna transition now to Mark Familio. Um, from Revitalizing Waterbury, and uh, thanks yeah. for being here, Mark. Good 
Uh, can everyone hear me? All right, yes, as Teresa mentioned, I'm Mark Milio. I'm the Economic Development Director with Revitalizing Waterbury. I'm going to be talking a little bit about a housing study and then um, going into designated downtown reinvestment statistics, which pertain to the designated downtown map that was showed in the previous presentation. Okay, a little background on the housing study. Um, Revitalizing Waterbury was reached out to by Main Street Group. They're a consulting firm out of New York and they're trying to build their present into Vermont. Their senior planning consultant that worked with us was currently staying in Vermont and wanted to build his clients there and that's why we reached out for it. Um, there was two components to the two main components to this study. One was a retail market analysis study that went into some other things that aren't too pertinent to this conversation, and then the one I'll be focusing on, which was a housing study. You can see that they conducted the majority of their analysis for the study in the fall and summer and fall of 2021, and then returned us a full report uh, February of 2022. Um, you can see that in other aspects, um, there was a survey that was done within the housing uh, to find some recommendations within the housing study. There was also analysis done on short-term rentals at the current point. And, and the, yeah, next slide. Okay, here's some just quick facts about Waterbury when the study was done. So we gotta remember this was, all the information is almost, what, a year old now? But it's the most relevant I have. So we have about 5,300 people here in the whole town of Waterbury. And I, it is important to mention when I'm talking about the housing study that it was done for the full town of Waterbury. It was not specifically narrowed down to the designated downtown. We can see that we have around 2,100 households. Okay, and then you can see this was an analysis done here. Uh, the amount of, by which median sales increased from 2019 to 2021 was approximately 30%, which is around $98,000. So in two years, our average medium house price here in Waterbury increased almost $100,000. Um, and then also something that was brought from the survey was that 87.5% of people felt that studio one bedroom and two bedroom housing best met their current and future needs for housing in the town of Waterbury. Now, based on all their analysis um, from, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not a planner, but for what they did, there was two recommendations that I took from the study that are pertinent to this conversation and to this proposal. The first one is, Waterbury should work with developers to construct housing for year-round residents. Additionally, restrictions can be implemented to ensure a percentage of the new housing was used for full-time residents and and those who qualified for housing assistance. And then also, Waterbury should prioritize the development of studio one and two bedroom housing, and the town should not focus on larger developments. Um, before I move on to the designated downtown reinvestment statistics, um, I want to mention that you can find the full housing study on the Revitalizing Waterbury website. On the top header, you go to the business section, it drops down to business resources, and you'll find the study there. You can download it as a PDF, and you're happy to come into the office if you don't have access to the printer, and we'll print you one. Um, now talking about the downtown reinvestment statistics. So as mentioned earlier, Waterbury, downtown Waterbury has a designated downtown. There's 23 currently in the state of Vermont, and Revitalizing Waterbury is responsible for the designated downtown organization. So we are the ones responsible for, within relation with the state and their organization to help make sure that what the state wants and the town wants are aligned in some ways. One of, those rec one of those priorities that our organization has to do every year is the lovely downtown reinvestment statistics. So at the end of 2021, this is the some of the main points from that document that was collected. Um, 
Yeah, so we I took, took apart the difference between commercial and residential use within the designated downtown, which was that area that was highlighted in the previous map, which is mainly revolves around Main Street within the downtown, but there are some areas that go outside of it. You can see the difference here. Commercial, there were seven vacancies at the time with a total of 8% total vacancy rate um, per unit. And then residential, we had a, we have a 199 total housing units within the designated downtown, and only 12 were created within that last year. And you can see that at the time there was not a single vacancy. Um, I guess that's all I really have to talk about. I'd love to open it up to questions. Oh, great. Um, so, oh, oh, I see hands popping all up. And one of the things I was realizing is that um, I have failed to enforce one of our um, ground rules. So I am now going to enforce one of our ground rules. Uh, so uh, when I call on you, please just state your name and whether you live in the district or, or not. That would be great. Would you like um, me to start? Or do, you want, do you want me to start? Or? Start one. <laughs> no, no, it's all right. Yes, Eric. My name is Derek Pistick. I live on Union Street. Um, seven vacancies. Are those like second and third floor office spaces? Um, I'd really like to know where there is a vacancy on street level for commercial. Um, yeah, there. it's all different kinds of vacancies. There's large office spaces. There are uh, first floor retail spaces. Where's that? Where's that first floor retail? Um, I think at the time there, um, there was at the end of 2021 there wasn't anybody in the old Green Mountain uh, Coin Place, um, but I, I can't remember the exact timeline. This was done in January of 2021, but yeah, I mean we just just this week we have a new commercial vacancy in the designated downtown, so it's happening now. It's happening in 2021. Um, there was an, there was another, yeah, there was two parts, I think. Was there, was there another part, Derek, to your question? Yeah, I just want to know how many uh, street-level retail spaces were open in the, in the historic district downtown. And I, except for what you say, there's one now. That's, that's the first I've of anything I know of. I mean, most of it is second and third floor commercial level, you know. Uh, yeah, Arvads, uh, above, uh Waterbury Sports. I understand those spaces are different, but that's different. So we need to make sure we just clarify that that there's not this glut of commercial downstairs retail space available in downtown. Retail versus office is kind of what you're, yeah. you're referencing. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I can try to go back to my report that was done at the end of this year and see if I noted exactly which one for. I'm sure I did. Okay, yes, go ahead. Gotcha. Kati D'Angelo, I am an youth like resident. Um, and I'm just wondering, how many inquiries, Mark, have you had for retail space? Um, I'd say over the past six or so months, there's been very little interest in retail spaces. The only commercial space that I've really had the most uh, like hits for are single person office spaces or ones wanting to work in a co-working space, which uh, we don't have available. Well, we do very recently, but it's more for artists. Um, and yeah, I've had one, the one I can remember the most was one that somebody was, somebody's building was being purchased and they had, um, commu you know, their clients were in this area, so they were looking for an, a place here in Waterbury, but they weren't specific to the downtown. Another, yes, go ahead. Uh, Valerie Rogers, South Main Street. Of the 5,300 Waterbury people that you've had on your board, how many were included in the survey? How many responded to your survey? For the survey component of the housing study, there was uh, just uh, over 100. 100 out of 5,300? Yeah, but um, that wasn't the only thing they used to get the results for the study. That was just one aspect of the analysis. Thank you. Chris? Yeah, Chris Yen's Waterbury Center. Um, your 8% total vacancy rating, how does that rate from a, on a, from a good to bad scenario? Usually uh, commercial in a, in a downtown, you want around 2 to 3%. Yes. I 
Uh, Cheryl Bloor, I am a club customer. Um, so one thing I'd kind of like to point out, thank you for sharing the survey, but we have to keep in mind too that the survey was done kind of right on the COVID cusp where everybody and their brother was fleeing the city to come to Vermont, kind of like the zombie movies. So it's kind of, you know, who did they talk to and how long had they lived here? Um, were they new to the area, not new to the area? So I'd kind of like to just have us keep that in mind when we're talking about the survey because 100 people responding out of 5,000 Waterbury residents to me is a little suspect. And, you know, we all know surveys and analysis can be taken in many different ways. So I just would like to. Yeah, I think that's a great disclaimer to know that whenever a survey is done, it's done from a single point of view and it's done from a a certain contractor and a, a team they're working on and it's done at a specific point in time. Mm -hmm. You know, we have studies that five years later tell a different story because of town's doing. So that is a good disclaimer when you're thinking about studies or reports, definitely. Mm -hmm. I don't know what Any time. Questions? So would it, oh, yes, go ahead. I just have something to add. I'm following Nina Siner from um, the Village and um, I can address some of the commercial. I've had, um, buildings in one lot for sale at the end of South Main Street. Those were vacant. It was the Karate Studio and two other buildings. And uh, those are now sold to a place who are waiting to close. And um, we had three offices in one building. By the end of 2021, they were not rented yet, but those were all rented. So that's <laughs> that's good. Thank you for the update. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And seven. That's all. Mm -hmm. And those are all within the designated downtown. They're, I'm confused as to exactly where that is. But that's, yeah, that's the further, the right the here, we're actually at like it's 114 South Main. It's the the end. So it's the other end. Oh, okay. So those would have not been counted They're within this. this mm -hmm. uh, yes, Lauren. Lauren Stavis from Randall Street. In the residential, um, is that a mix of ownership and uh, rental? Yeah, that is total housing units. So based on what the building is classified, mm -hmm. so if it's classified as a single family you know, home, it's one dwelling unit, it's an apartment with three dwellings, and there's three dwelling units. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's a mix. Yes, it's, it's total, okay. total residential units within the downtown. Great, thank you so much, Mark. Yeah. Um, as Mark uh, said you can take a this is just really very brief excerpts from this study you can uh, if you want more in-depth information and more information about the methodology um, feel free to go to the RW website and I think this is, was on the town's website at one point in time I'm not sure if it still is but um, you can find it on the revitalizing Waterbury website so thanks so much Mark appreciate it and if we could have a mic exchange with Alyssa, that would be great. Uh, next up is going to be Alyssa Johnson, and she's going to talk uh, a bit about the zoning requirements. What are the parameters for uh, that, uh, that any kind of developers needs to stay within for 51 South Main Street? How are we doing on sound with the Orca guy? Good? OK, awesome. Hi everyone, apologies for the improper introduction earlier. That was kind of haphazard. My name is Alyssa Johnson. I live on South Main Street. I'm currently a member of the select board. I am not here today on behalf of the select board. I'm here because I'm really excited to talk about zoning. I hope you all are too. And so they can usually rope me into talking about zoning or doing tech things. Um, so all of that said, um, this presentation, if you came to our first introduction meeting, was given by Neil Leitner, who is our town's assistant planning and zoning administrator. Both Neil and our planning and zoning director, Steve Lotsky, are in uh, Maine for a planning conference. So again, you got me. Um, this is going through the planning and zoning process. So this is the process that any project located on the parcel that is 51 South Main Street would have to go to. This process has not begun yet for this proposed Down Street project or any other project, but this process here today is just the process that anything would have to go through if it was on the site. Um, right now, we talked about we have town plans. They are adopted for sometimes long spans of time, so say five to eight years. 
In the planning world, the town plan is the overall vision. The zoning regulations are where the rubber meets the road in terms of what we as a community would actually regulate and require for someone building a project somewhere in the community. I say that because we have a set of zoning regulations and sometimes they need to be updated. So for this particular parcel, what is governing it is actually a set of interim bylaws. A previous select board adopted those, so that's what governs it. It's in a downtown zoning district. So Katie spoke a little bit about this. So the parcel, 51 South Main Street, is located in the downtown zoning district and currently that's governed by the, who downtown <laughs> interim bylaws adopted on March 26th. All of that to say there's a big table that, as we said, where the rubber meets the road, what do we allow, what do we not allow in this district? Um, Multifamily dwellings are p permitted use in that table. Apologies again for the uh, design reading of this. Katie spoke about our designated downtown district. Again, for folks, I should also say I used to work for Revitalizing Waterbury at the same job as Mark, so I have it deeply entrenched in my brain. If you're visualizing it, it is the railroad bridge with the sculpture to where we are right now, 114 South Main Street. That's our designated downtown district, basically immediately adjacent along Main Street, north and south, and also it does include Pilgrim Park. Um, all that to say, one of the things where the rubber meets the road, we have this place we want to concentrate planning. So then we have an overlay zoning district in the same way that the flood regulations are an overlay on the flood district. This is an overlay for the downtown and it's specifically focused on design and making sure that the design for the area is consistent. So again, this is the DRB process. This would be true for any project. Um, has to be reviewed by the DRB or Development Review Board. They'll get a shout out in a minute, but I know we have multiple members in the room as we speak. Um, the Development Review Board is a quasi-judicial board appointed by the select board. Their job is not to say if they like a project or don't like a project. Their job is to say, does this project meet specific criteria that is outlined in our regulations? Two of the sections that they will have to review, again, because of this particular location for any project at this location, um, is the downtown design review standards and also site plan, which just has to do with the type of project. Um, as has been said, DRB meetings are public. Here's the shout out, thanks to the seven folks who spend two Wednesdays a month going through zoning and permitting applications to alternates as well, but these are the folks on your development review board. This, waterbraidvt.com, um, also would be where any materials for any zoning and permitting application in the town you are curious about can be found. Um, this is all copy paste, so like I did in my old one, I opened up the zoning regulations and copy and pasted, so this is Section 1108, Design Review Standards. These are the things that any hypothetical project needs to meet that the Development Review Board um, is reviewing. Let's see if I get a little laser guy. Where's Josh? Don't think I have it. Anyway, building design, <laughs> reinforcing the streetscape, um, similar size, height, scale, massing. Um, if you have a new addition, it needs to be compatible with the historic structure. We want a pedestrian streetscape where folks can walk on the sidewalk. Again, we have, as Katie talked about, the big vision of we want this downtown where people can walk, and this is the way we're able to regulate it. Um, the more specific site plan review, um, this is just, again, some of the things that that awesome group of folks has to consider in reviewing an application. Again, this is a copy paste from our regulations, section 301, pages four to six, if anyone's interested. Um, they will take into consideration the following objectives, traffic access, traffic flow, location of driveways, pedestrian safety, circulation and parking. Um, shout out to another section 414. So we do in our zoning regulations have a whole table with how much parking is needed for what type of use, for what type of unit. So again, any hypothetical project needs to have, okay, do you have enough parking? They're reviewing, do you have it there? Um, do you need trees and shrubs? Are you buffering it from the street? <laughs> Landscaping, um, and that's the last one, I'm almost done. Um, but again, this is part of what a development review board is reviewing through site plan approval. 
And that's really it. Again, I am not the expert on this. I am not our planning or zoning administrator, but we have professionals who do it. This is the criteria they're looking at. Um, and on the ground, that is run by, again, your local development review board, and that is a public process. Um, I will say abutting neighbors in development review board processes have to get certified mail notifications. That's the first thing they say. If you've been to the hearing, they say, hi, can I have your... Uh, mail receipts and if you don't have them that's the end of that you can go home for the night because they can't have the hearing if all of their neighbors haven't gotten their certified mail that's all i have great um okay i'm just um just a, a second um just want to check in uh and one thank Alyssa for uh stepping in um on the zoning uh any clarifications about what Alyssa went through okay and That's that same one. I think it's actually a really long title. Um, the designated downtown desk technically has two sub. One is the historic commercial district and one is like the commercial industrial district, which is Pilgrim Park. They have very slightly different regulations, but both are in that designated downtown. You're correct. And it does have historic in that title too. And that was in Imhoff who lives downtown. <laughs> Um, other, uh, other questions or clarifications? And we do have uh, DRB members in the room. Please case, correct me. They do case, this all the time. In case there's uh, specific questions that Alyssa might not be able to field. Any other questions about that? We have four minutes. <laughs> we didn't go over on zoning, <laughs> Teresa. I can't believe it. <laughs> Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, Lisa. and last plug I will say, Kate didn't say because she's on the Planning Commission, so I'm going to say it for her. The Planning Commission is working on updating our zoning regulations. So if you think that how much parking we think you should require is wrong, or you think that a certain type of use shouldn't or shouldn't be allowed in a certain area, that's what zoning regulations are for. And just to say, I go to the Planning Commission meetings. I'm usually the only member of the public. If you want to join on a Monday <laughs> night, at least for a public comment, that is a thing that offers public input, um, and they always love it. Alyssa, could you, yeah, I'm sorry, could you, I, I'm still on the minute. Yeah, I just, could you speak up a bit? Okay, so, I, as you know, I've been to that, the commission where I tried to say that the center was wrong, but it's, I was told it's going to take two, three years to get everything. <laughs> yeah, so it. That doesn't really, that's not helpful, really. No, it's yeah, fine. It's a slow process. That's why I said the downtown has interim bylaws, and those actually happen because that process was taking so long. So I absolutely acknowledge I got on the Planning Commission because I said, let's get this bylaw done. We right. just approved a grant as the select board for them saying, let's get this done as soon as possible. Um, it's hard and complicated to come up with regulations that then get put up in the front of the room at a meeting like this to say, is this the right thing that we all agreed on and that our lay people can administer? And so certainly I think it is really time intensive and I totally acknowledge that, that it's hard to come in with a challenge. We had, a, I think there was another property owner at the same meeting who same thing came in with a really specific issue they hoped would be addressed with that rewrite. So right. absolutely, it's a slow and laborious public process and I'm not gonna sugarcoat that in any way, but I'm gonna say that working towards improving that when folks know that there are issues, there are other ways to remedy it. So we, for example, now I'm putting the select board hat on, the select board can approve interim zoning for imminent issues that come up, like imminent issues like our zoning regulations didn't define a brewery, and we had a situation with a brewery, and now we have interim zoning regulations that define a brewery. So there are ways that that input, even though the long game, getting that full rewrite done might take a while, can be used more short term. But I do hear you. It's a long process. Okay. I, you know, I don't want to bring up a specific house. I'm talking about the downtown, the district that you're talking about. I'm not talking about the one outside of there. <laughs> um, so, you know, a particular house that was used to be a duplex, but now the town won't let us make it a duplex anymore. I've had multiple people come to me about this. I'm mm -hmm. like, there's nothing I can do about it. And I was like, why can't that be? Yeah, those, that, I mean, I think that you've certainly got a relevant issue in question about that, but I'm going to sort of yes, kind let's of go on. bring it back to 51 South Main Street. Um, and, uh, but I appreciate very much what um, the question is, and uh, hopefully members of the DRB or zoning people can 
uh, you know, maybe catch you at a break or um, to have a, a conversation with you about that bill, Mina. Mm -hmm. Thank you for bringing it up. So. Any other questions about um, 51 South Main and the kind of process it's going to need to go through in order to, uh, you know, move any project along there at, at that address? Great. Thank you so much, Alyssa. And I don't see Mark. Is Mark here? Did he come in? Oh, all okay. right. Mark, you're up. <laughs> Well, I think it, the order changed. Didn't the order change? Is it, is it Mark? It's Mark on mine. Yeah. On, on, the, on, the, uh, yeah, on the latest one, it's, it's you, Mark. You get the microphone. Yeah. yeah. I don't have much prepared. So. That's, a, that's OK. They, this is more for Orca than it is anybody else. Thanks. Thank you. This is uh, Mark Fryer. Hello. Is it working? How can I tell if my mic's all right? Great. It's, it's for oh, OK. Um, well, this is awesome. I, I'm really excited that at least um, the amount of people here, I mean, I was on the select board for seven years, and this is the most I think I ever saw in, in, in a meeting like that. So um, you know, I, I think I was asked to, to speak here, and I spoke at the last informational meeting about the needs of the business community. I think personally, I. I it frustrates me to see comments about specific to the restaurant industry. I think for the folks in here that are employers, I think it's it's across the board. It's uh, I happen to employ a significant number of people, but there's plenty of other folk in town that are also employing people that are struggling um, with em employment and finding employees. And, and a lot of it is a conversation around housing. Um, give a little background on myself. I was on the select board for seven years, chair for one. Um, I've been on groups from the what used to be the Waterbury Tourism Council, um, then the RWs, um, WADC, which is the Waterbury Area Community Development Group that tries to work um, for retaining business, growing business, and bringing business. Um, but so much more in those meetings, we talk about housing because you can bring business here, but if they can't find employees, um, it's a problem. And I think, I unfortunately, was a little late, so I don't know if that was brought up. Um, in scenarios where there are businesses that I think want or could be in town that might choose not to or have pulled out because they're concerned surrounding the ability to find employees for their business. Um, I think we're going to continue to see that problem. Um, you know, I, I sometimes have to wear my, like, I own a restaurant hat. And then other times I try to represent myself as much more broadly pro Waterbury, believe in this community. Um, is doing the right things, um, but I think we're getting it wrong with housing. Um, I think, it, did anyone see recently there was a picture of what Burlington looked like? I don't know what era it was, probably 1940s. It was all like single story. It was really low. Maybe it was much earlier than that. I think that's the growth that, we, you know, we sat in those select board meetings and talked a lot about the concern on sprawl. And if the demand for housing is needed, where do you put those those, that housing and the infrastructure of sewer and water is a, a big answer of where you put it. Um, and also the conversation surrounding transportation. Um, so I think that's why you got to really look at the downtown as the opportunity. I totally understand concerns about size and scale. And there are things within the zoning rules that help address that. Um, but then in this specific case, this property is owned by a former village that is a municipality that they've decided to put it out to vote. So it's, it's a little unique situation, but I'm, I'm glad we're here talking about it. Um, for me personally, with the restaurant hat, I have employees that struggle to find housing. And there's not a lot of new faces coming to town. And I think a lot of it has to do with housing. I think if you were anywhere in the United States and you hear something great about Vermont, or maybe even specifically Waterbury, great. Um, where are you going to find housing? If they're going to go to Craigslist, probably is the, the first thing they're going to look at. And I don't know if anyone's been on Craigslist, but not much there, and it's very expensive. So you're going to move up end your life, move to Waterbury, if you don't even know if you can afford to live there. Um, I think there's a lot of conversation around the, the, the term vacancy. Um, years ago, I, I really started to like look at vacancy as trying to understand how that creates affordability. And, and what it does is it's a supply demand. If you have too much supply and demand isn't there, then prices will flatten or maybe go down. If we have, don't have enough supply and we have way too much demand, which is, I think, what's currently happening, um, you see prices go up. Um, COVID didn't help. Um, we were talking about affordability and housing supply 
and, and Tom Stevens can, can agree with me that I reached out to him years ago and said, we're short, like we need more housing. And this was before COVID. And then COVID happens and a bunch of people can now work from home. And so now they're in cities going, well, I can live anywhere I want. Vermont looks great. Waterbury looks great. We'll come to Waterbury. Um, so I think we're, we're fighting that short-term housing has also been a big, um, and I don't know if that's been talked about before, but um, short-term housing is really hard to get the quantifiable numbers on what that's doing to our market. But I really think that um, it's this quiet beast, not saying that it's a kind of economy that shouldn't exist, but it did take a lot of what used to be long-term rentals and turn them into short-term housing, or it took single family houses and turn them into short-term housing. So I think it's a little bit of everything and it's impacting all of our real estate problems. Um, so you know, sitting on the select board, you know, I, I see a lot of the front porch forum posts about affordability and this project and just bigger conversations around affordability. The, the years that we as a select board were able to not raise your tax rate was when the grand list grew. Because every year, typically, our budget's going to, or Waterbury's budget's going to go up. I'm no longer on the select board. Um, but typically, the, it's going to, wages are increasing. There's certain things that are just inflationary that, that are going to bring that budget up. And the way to offset that is to grow grand lists at the same rate. Um, we picked up 60 units on Blush Hill. The hotels there, um, there's certain projects that kept your affordability, if anyone's in here a homeowner, which I think quite a few are, that's what really drove a lot of the reason we were able to keep the tax rate where it was. So um, to me, seeing projects like this, you, you know, as my restaurant hat, great. I think it will help with the um, vacancy rate situation. Is it going to solve it? No, that's not even near. I think I was in meetings years ago on the 60 units on Blush Hill, and I remember somebody stood up and said, we don't need 60 units on Blush Hill those got rented immediately and we still have a housing problem. So I think like 24 units or 30 units isn't gonna fix it. Is it gonna help? I think so. Um, I think it will help start to, start to move a needle. It's not enough. I think there needs to be continued projects and I think Downstreet knows that too. Um, and I, I, hope, I always hope that the changes and the work that was being done on the planning commission and through zoning would entice more development um, you know, smart, controlled, but where was appropriate for trying to grow a town that also has a bunch of folks who've been here a while, and, and I understand and respect all of that. But I think as it's always a challenge when you grow a community, how you do it, where, and all the details surrounding it. And it's not an easy thing. There's a lot of folks doing a lot of work on it. Um, but yeah, I, I think there's a lot of misinformation that's come out during this project. So hopefully a lot of that's being cleared clarified tonight, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions in any hat I ever have worn. <laughs> there have been multiple ones. Yeah. Um, thank you, Mark, so much for uh, sort of talking about it from a business owner perspective. Uh, I'm just going to check in. Are there any other business owners here who might want to say a thing or two um, uh, about the need for housing as it relates to their business? Uh, yes. Uh, hi, happy Angel. I live in town and I also own uh, Bridgeside Books with my husband. And we have three part-time employees, two of whom, one lives in the village, one lives in the center. Both of them have had trouble finding another place to live. And um, they, one at least, as you know, is um, living in a rather substandard place and really has no choice but to stay there. Um, and if you don't own a car, and you need to stay in the village, that's also a big problem. If you work within walking distance and you have to move, that's a big problem. Um, if we don't have employees to work at our businesses, we will close. That's it. Thank you for sharing, Doctor. Anybody else here to share about a business owner? Um, yes, go ahead, Chris. Chris Vienna, I'm going to ask you, Mark, what's, what's the secret number? Uh, typically, I think the healthy is three to three and five. So I think it's three percent vacancy and rental five and single family, or it might be flip flop. So that I, I can't remember, but that's so you take the entire market. And the problem is, is that if if and I think um, if you Google vacancy rate 
healthy vacancy rate in Vermont, you get an article and it talks about how there, there's data similar to, I think, the conversation and questions on Mark's. Um, you got to look a little deeper sometimes on the data. And I think the data doesn't know how to pick up short-term rentals. It thinks that housing's available when it's really not. So there's data saying that, oh, that's not a homesteaded property, so that must be available. Um, second homes and, and single family, or I mean uh, short-term rental, um, I think the short-term rental, they don't know how to pick that data up. So it might look like we're in a healthy vacancy situation, but we're really not. And I think the answer lies on Craigslist or Zillow. I mean, look, go on Zillow and look at single family houses for sale in the area under half a million, you're not gonna find many, right? So it's, um, I think that's the reality of the situation is it's three to five. So you take the number of housing units, say you just wanna do Waterbury, it's 5,500 people, let's say, I don't know what it is a thousand houses or whatever it is. So it's thousand times 0.03, and that's your your number, and that should be sitting vacant at any one time to have a healthy market. And there's there's a less than a handful available, not the hundreds or 50 or whatever the answer is there. My, my bigger question is because I've been in the housing construction industry for years. Uh, can you really ever get ahead of? Yeah, I think communities that start to plan, you know, some, some have figured it out. I think even if you look at Morrisville and the amount of construction that's happening in Morrisville, um, I think some of that is through zoning and the rule book and density. Um, you know, a lot of times even uh, somebody mentioned that they can't turn their single family house back into a duplex, um, stuff like that. Uh, um, uh, ADUs, accessory, accessory dwelling units, are other things that cities are doing to try to create additional units within the infrastructure that basically exists and also give folks opportunities to make their homestead more viable. Um, stuff like that, I think, can, can move the needle. Um, yeah, I think you can. I really do. Um, unfortunately, you have the challenges of construction costs, contractors, you know, even just the ability of, of all the trades. Um, I think we're, we're in for a difficult lesson there. Um, and it, it's, it's great if you got into the market before COVID, but the folks that don't own homes or um, are trying to get in this community and just rent, those are the folks that are left out. And they they're, might not even be in this meeting tonight, but um, I always had as a select board and try to think outside of my own personal world and I think that there's decisions that we can make as a community to make sure that it's available for everybody, not just the folks that have been here. So um, it's a challenge. I get it. And, and, I, and I understand the concerns. Um, I actually parked on Main Street and walked by Down Street's building right there. And I was like, I've never actually walked by here at night. And it's not this crazy apartment complex that, like, I don't know, it feels very nice. And I, would, I support it, obviously. But... Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's going to take a lot of work to get there. This project isn't going to be the only solution, but it's part of it. Thanks very much for yep. sharing your experience. No problem. Right. Uh, Katja, um, since you've spoken already, I'm going to uh, recognize Can I ask something later. after? <laughs> yeah, sorry. No Are you asking me a question? Yeah. I'll leave my mic on. kind of uh, requirement that people who move into this development have to contribute or have to work in a local uh, I don't think that's I don't think you can fair housing laws prevent us from stating no waterbury preference so saying yeah live or work in waterbury so unfortunately that's, that's a good not thing to consider option. and I got into a conversation with someone asking like so excuse me just a moment yeah. I'm hearing sort of rumbles of uh, conversations <laughs> and uh, it's a great question, and when the Down Street folks come up, um, they can address that um, answer maybe a little bit more fully. Okay? But I do want to say that um, I think instead of trying to think about that as a way to control, say, this building, it's more the market. If there's people that can work from home that are now moving to Vermont, there's an extra pressure on demand, and we have to come with, with supply. And, and you don't have to then have those rules. You just know that there's folks that want to come work here from home, how do we how do we address that supply demand on top of people who are working locally and the other challenges? 
Waterbury on its own is not going to solve the entire housing crisis in the state of Vermont. I mean, that is just a fact. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, okay, uh, Skip is up next to uh, give us an update on the parking study that uh, that was done. And um, there are, I just want to do, uh, there are restrooms right here out to the right. Uh, uh, if you need to take a break and um, feel free to, you know, just get up and move around or stretch your legs if you need to. Thank you. Skip. Yes, thank you, Teresa. Um, parking. Um, we heard at one of the earlier meetings concern about parking, that if we put the building on 51 South Main Street, there will be a loss of uh, parking, and did we need that? Um, so we've looked into that. Um, there, uh, in 2016, the trustees, in trying to decide what to do with 51, we're hearing concerns, you know, there's no parking in downtown. The potential TD bank was uh, going to be lost and things. So we engaged uh, Stantec to do a parking study of the downtown. And uh, it was a very interesting and very valuable study, I think, in helping us make decisions on uh, what to do. And... Uh, their standard is if there's an available parking space within 400 feet of where you want to go, they count that space as uh, being able to walk, especially in a rural area that you can walk. You might not um, have that standard if you're in New York City, but uh, up here in Vermont. So they counted all the spaces uh, between... Uh, 400 feet between the intersection of Stowe Street and Main Street was the center of their study. And they found that there were 314 spaces within 400 feet of that corner. And at the time they did the study, um, later on we'll see the percentage, but the available parking space at TD Bank has since been uh, doubled from about 20, I think it's 37 now and things. So. This update of this parking study is uh, after the last meeting the commissioners authorized. Um, so an update to that uh, 2016 study. Um, it's helpful, uh, you know, in the determination that we were going to keep 51 South Main Street as parking until the Main Street reconstruction was done. It didn't get utilized as parking as much as we thought it would during the construction. It might have been used more by construction equipment than people's cars. And uh, so we've got the update to the study. Um, here's the study area that they did update. It's, uh, there's a red line, which me being colorblind don't see very well, but <laughs> hopefully you folks can uh, see it. And uh, it's a supplemental to the 2016 report um, 51 South Main Street, they lost, if there's 27 spaces at 51 South Main, so they would go away. So they assumed that those are lost. The additional spaces at uh, the TD Bank that are paid for parking, and uh, there's an additional uh, private uh, parking lot at the Freak Folk Beer on Stowe Street that wasn't there before. I think they didn't include, uh, we now have a uh, parking agreement with the Congregational Church about some additional spaces there. Plus, when Main Street was constructed, they didn't lose as many spaces as they originally anticipated in the design. Um, here's a summary of, uh, they counted private and public spaces that are available um, for use. Prior to the 2016 um, report, there were 345 spaces. They needed 240, uh, 204. So there was 141 extra. It was a 59% utilization at the peak period of those spaces. In 2022, there were 375 spaces. Some of those are the uh, ones at uh, 51 South Main Street. They needed 263, so it was a 70% occupancy of the parking. Um, if we take away 51 South Main Street, 
the available spaces are 348. They still need 263. So it was a 70% occupancy rate of the parking with the loss of 51. Um, below, if you counted only the public spaces, not the private spaces, um, the numbers have, uh, with the loss of 51, it's 179 spaces. They needed 156. Um, so it was 87% occupancy for parking. 90% is the standard. So it was below the uh, limit for the utilization there. Um, this is a graph that shows uh, the blue is the available spaces and the uh, sort of the red color, I assume, <laughs> um, is the uh, spaces that are uh, utilized there and stuff. So the conclusion was that selling 51 and reducing the parking spaces by the 27 is expected to result in a tolerable impact on the public parking uh, spaces and its uh, parking supply is expected to remain adequate to serve the public if we lose um, those spaces. Whoop. Is that the last slide? Okay. Um, so anyway, that's where we looked into that at the last meeting that the loss of 51, there still be the standard uh, parking for the businesses in town. So. Thank you, Skip. So. Um uh, I don't need that. Oh. You might. I'm not sure. <laughs> In case people ask questions. So, um, so let me just uh, clarify to make sure that if people were here at the previous meeting, this has been updated since the previous meeting. Yes. Oh, okay. So this is uh, maybe new information from new, the last new meeting. New information since the uh, last meeting. Okay. Great. So thank you. Uh, up back, please, first. I think it's posted. Did I send you the updated? Um, if it's not, it will be. I think the full parking report. Yeah, yeah. There you go. I know, I know, I know it's new, so, but yeah, it'd be great to see the details. Okay, so the, the, um, just so everybody could hear, the question was, is this posted online? And if it's not, it will be shortly. Both the original study and the update. Just, uh, I'm just gonna, I, I'm just gonna check to make sure uh, if there's anybody who maybe hasn't spoken yet. I want to make sure people get a chance. Everybody gets a chance to ask a question if they want to. Before I, okay, go ahead, Lawrence. Lawrence. Skip. Did, that study did not include <laughs> the parking that we get on the weekends on Randall Street, does it? No, uh, Randall Street is not in the, the parking. The restaurant parking on Randall Street, but that wasn't part of the study. I think down Elm Street is, but not up Randall. Oh, okay. Thank you. That's all I wanted. Thank you. Thank yep. you. Um, Skip, was this study done in anticipating the opening of the new restaurant, or just as things are now? It, it's the businesses that are operating today, I believe. Okay. They, so it they, doesn't take into account when the... Yeah, the, the one that's been three years in the making. Yeah. <laughs> so it doesn't take into account the increased parking that might be needed when that finally I I don't think so, but you'd have to. Woody might know, but I. Okay. Did I did I see another question hand go up? Did I miss? Uh, yes. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, John Gray, if you need, I think uh, I don't know how many units down streets the closing. Twenty. That'll be part of their permitting through the zoning and things. They'll have to design it to comply with the zoning regs for the number of spaces they'll need per unit and stuff. So that would be independent of this. I, 
I start, excuse me. I can address that question yeah. during the downstream presentation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you yeah, so much. No Appreciate it. Uh, Mark, did you want to say something? No, I just remember the last meeting. Okay, yeah, so, so um, in case people couldn't hear, um, Downstreet will address parking um, and the design for parking during their part of the presentation coming up next. Um, any other questions here? And I just wanted to take an opportunity not to embarrass Karen, but um, <laughs> in case some of you haven't met our new town clerk, maybe you could just say hello. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for being here tonight, Karen. Uh, okay, uh, next we have um, Downstreet um, that's going to review the proposal, any modifications they made to the proposal, and answer your, your questions. So I'm not sure who this is Nicola. Okay. Sure, that would be awesome. Thank you. Okay. Or you can put it on the computer, on the floor, too. The floor is all yours. Thank you. I'm not fancy. And you get an extra one and a half minutes from Skip. Oh, thank you, Skip. <laughs> Compliments of the house. Awesome, thank you. <laughs> so, hi everyone. My name is Nicola Anderson. I'm the Director of Real Estate Development for Downstreet Housing and Community Development. I'm joined today with Kazai Haviland, who's our Project Manager, and Angie Harbin, who is our Executive Director. Um, I really just want to start uh, by thanking everyone who's been here and presented tonight and at the public hearing last week, and also to thank all of you for being here tonight. You know, it's really nice to have a healthy discussion about housing, um, and just especially those of you that have been out supporting housing, understanding the need for housing in the community. Oh no, <laughs> I took too long. <laughs> no. Is it this? Oh, we're good. Nope. Sorry, I am not the te <laughs> I am not the technical one in the organization. Oh, this is a PowerPoint here. I know. Oh, you device manager. Just by duplicate or scan through it, connect it mm -hmm. to it. Yep. Oh, you're smart. So I mean, I'll I'll just get started as we're going. So we uh, we serve Washington, Orange, and Lamoille counties. Um, we currently have 448 rental units in our portfolio. We have 82 manufactured uh, mobile home lots. We have 160 shared equity units. And then in the last two years, our home ownership center have averaged serving 325 households per year with the different services that they provide. So we do provide many different services in central Vermont. I'm just gonna go over my notes because the PowerPoint's <laughs> not working, so bear with me, I'm so That's sorry. Right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this isn't my background either, unfortunately, <laughs> but hey. Um, so just um, based off of my notes, you know, we really, we serve, we have multiple uh, services for different Vermonters. You know, we provide, so we have our rental units, we have our home ownership center. Currently in Waterbury, oh, excellent. Thank you so much. I'm just going to slide through. Oh, there's notes on that one. Oh. Slack, sorry. <laughs> I don't think it's anything bad. <laughs> no, we're good, don't worry. There we go. Excellent. So we, have multi we provide multiple services um, at Down Street. We, re we serve everybody, people that work and live in our communities. Many different services. There we go. So in Waterbury, we have three properties. We currently have 62 adults and 29 children under 29 in our portfolios. We have 32 one-bedroom units, th 23 two-bedroom units, and two three-bedroom units out of our three buildings. We currently have zero vacancies out of all of our units. So Providing housing opportunities is so important. It really affects all aspects of, yes. Um, I need you to speak up just a little bit. Sorry, thank you, sorry. 
So um, affordable housing and housing directly affects all aspects of a person's life, often extending beyond individuals' health and their, how they are in the community. Sorry. <laughs> all right, again, back to the notes. So <laughs> unfortunately, I hope we're able to pull this up. We did have drawings from last time. You know, we had a solar study done. So, so once these come up, we'll go through, we're getting to some of information that was provided last time and then we're going to have new information. So our solar study drawings, you know, we really heard, we really tried to listen to the community and questions that have come to us. We know that there's neighbors that have solar panels in their homes. We want to make sure that this design does not impact the residents. We're, we're really trying to be considerate of that. You know, the design we've been considerate of, it's a three-story building that we're trying to develop, not a four-story. We know that one of the proposals that came, I think in 2015, was four stories, really tall, and it towered over um, some of the other buildings on that street. We've um, engaged with our architect for a design to see a comparable, what this building could look like. You know, we've tried to be, we've worked with the architect for a setback, even on that third story, to really, so that, that design won't negatively impact the community or the surrounding units. Um, when that comes up, we'll definitely show those designs with you. Um, the next slide is I'm going to talk about the floodplain. So again, the part of this parcel is in the floodplain. And with that, we, we really worked through the design to try to keep the building out of the floodplain. So the design, um, if you're looking at the parcel from the road, you'll see the design, the entrance road um, goes, is to the right, because there's a, the floodplain swoops around to the right and around the back of the building. So the way that we have designed the building at this time is that that entrance road, and then, ooh, we could be, it's not my background, <laughs> sorry. Oh, Yay. awesome. Could you add, I'm going to go back, sorry. Solar study, sorry, I really want to show these designs. So the top two images are from August. So in the morning and the evening in August. These, and this will kind of show you, so at like 10 a.m. and 5 p.m., you know, what that, um, just the shadows, the impacts. Down below, and there was, a, there was an issue at the last meeting of the, the design that we had shared then. So we uh, corrected that with the uh, software that we have. So this is at on December 21st, the shortest day of the year, what that shadow, what that impact will be. So we have here is 10 a.m. and here is 5 p.m. Just to show of that, the shadow impact from this building, longer building, where those shadows, how that will impact the neighboring buildings that are currently there. Nicholas, 3 p.m. 3 p.m., yes. Sorry, yes, it's 3 p.m. That I may have said 5. I really apologize, 3 p.m. And then to the floodplain, like I was saying, so this here, floodplain goes around and swoops this way. So again, I want to be honest with you, these are preliminary sketches. This is not the final design. It is not the final design that will be for the site plan, anything about this drawing. This will and this can and may change we really want the community's input and involvement through this whole process. That is a priority of us. That's why we're continuing. We're listening. We've changed things about the design already from the meeting in August. We'll continue to reach out to the community, the neighbors, any type of feedback there. But really important, you know, we do have flood insurance um, as part of our policies. But again, this would be the entranceway out back. The parking would end up being in the floodplain. Part of this design, as well as zoning regulations, the building has to be within eight feet of um, the main road. So that's part of the design as well. You know, we can't set the building back and then have parking at the front, um, just with design elements. Um, so this, this may change. Again, we, not a guaranteed layout of, we're definitely gonna have a two bedroom there or community space there, but roughly this is what the building could look like. Um, and so definitely, again, heard that people really want to see and understand what this building could look like in the street view. So we worked with our architect um, to design a building that will have, so this is 24 to 26 units. 
Um, again, this is not the final design, but you know, with it, so a nice panorama of our neighboring buildings. Um, and there are, there's three story buildings. This is a building here. So we really um, have, have really wanted to have this entrance view, street view. You know, it's a three story building. You can see there's a setback. Here you can see that too. So it's not just a towering three story building that looks like a rectangle. Again, this could change. We're not hoping for a rectangle building that's a box. You know, we really want to make sure that this design can fit in with the streetscape. At this point, even with a setback, even with different design elements, we can fit 24 to 26 units on this site, which is our goal. Also, something that we, we heard loud and clear at this last public hearing, there is an interest of providing a commercial space at this lot. It is something that we're seriously going to look into and it's something that already with design we have started those conversations. We've also decided, had those conversations locally, figuring out what the rents are for commercial spaces so that we can start working within our budget to figure out if we can financially make this possible. Uh, we're, with the design already, you can see, again, sketch, this could change, but we have, we've created this front space to look like a commercial space, these commercial storefront windows, this front entrance, um, this great, a nice entranceway that's really welcoming for a good storefront retail option. You know, with this, um, we are the funding that we're able to access we're not able to use that for a commercial retail space so that is something that you know we're we're out here we're sharing this that we're looking into if we get interest from a community member from a commercial space that's really interested in this we can start really investigating those numbers taking a look at what's financially viable to develop there um you know we know that we've been looking into commercial rents at this time you know, it's 14 to $18 a square feet. That's what it's taking to develop and to make this financially viable. But um, we do need a separate funding option in order to make this financially move forward as well. But we are, we're looking into this. If there is people that are really interested, please reach out to us and we'd love to have those conversations. So a little bit about what is affordable housing. So defined by um, the Department of Housing and Urban Development. So housing is um, it pay, it means that individuals or families pay no more than 30% of their gross income towards the housing. Um, so we downstreet believe there's not one perfect solution for affordable housing. That's why we, you know, we offer rental units, we offer home ownership opportunities, we offer these different, we offer first time home buyer um, incentives. Uh, we offer, we have manufactured um, home community lots. Um, there's many different services that Downstreet provides to provide affordable housing opportunities in central Vermont. So as um, a nonprofit developer, we develop to last. We develop, we, the properties that we develop, it's with our funding sources, it's perpetual affordability. So perpetual affordability means that in 10 years, these can't change to condominiums. These can't change to Airbnb lots. These will forever be rental units. And they have to always, they will forever have these income restrictions tied to them. So really that means then that a nonprofit is gonna own these. Due to the fact that we are gonna own these long term and because of the funding that we have in place, we build high quality buildings. We have, we, we have restrictions on accessibility, on energy efficiency. Um, you know, we put solar in all of our new buildings. We're putting highly efficient heat and AC. We're insulating our buildings really well. We're putting um, electric car charging stations that community members can use at our properties as well. These are all the restrictions that we're able to access, but it's something that we're developing really high quality that's built to last. Um, that's something that's really important to us as an organization, but also to the funders that we uh, get our funding from too. So I'm actually gonna invite Angie Harbin, up, our CEO. She's gonna discuss a little bit more about um, the, 
people that we have live at our units. I can give you that. Do I need your mic? Oh, yeah, that's true. Oh, and I've got it in the pocket somewhere. I can just stand next to you. Excellent, because I have no pockets. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, shoot. That was me. Review of our entire... I also realized I forgot to address parking, so I will go back to that after Andy stops speaking. So sorry about that. Thanks, Nicola. So I'm going to talk very briefly about low-income housing tax credits, area median income, and how we determine affordability in the projects that Downstreet develops. Uh, so low-income housing tax credits, or LIHTC, is a national program. It is um, the most common source of um, funding to develop affordable housing. And I'm using it kind of as a placeholder. So low-income housing tax credits are used by every state in the nation. They've been around since the 80s. It's considered one of the most um, effective sources of income for affordable housing. And because of that, a lot of other affordable housing funding sources pattern their affordability requirements after LIHTC. So it's a good um, example to use when explaining affordability. Uh, so the way LIHTC works, we have the federal government, they have tax credits. They're set aside specifically to develop affordable housing. So they uh, allocate those tax credits to states on a per capita basis. Vermont, of course, gets the small state minimum. And those go to the state's housing finance agency. In Vermont, that's the Vermont Housing Finance Agency, who then allocate those tax credits to projects on a competitive basis. So those tax credits are available to both for-profit and non-profit developers. Um, so they will annually say to the community, hey, we've got tax credits that we're going to allocate. Um, developers like Downstreet, we bring our projects forward, we say, We've got a project for you. We'd really like to develop it using your tax credits. They review all of those projects. They're generally looking at, uh, does the developer have the capacity to develop with tax credits? LIHTC is complicated and there's a lot of regulations and so not just anybody can use those as a housing source. They're making sure that the project that is presented uh, meets all of the LIHTC and state regulations. And then they're also making sure those projects further state housing goals. So when we present our projects to the state and then they, they choose their, their projects that they're going to uh, fund that year, it's not 100% of the funding, it's part of what we call a funding stack. And then as the developer, we sell those tax credits um, to an investor, we then use that cash as uh, one of the sources where we build our housing. So when we're presenting our project to the state, we commit to, as Nicola mentioned, uh, permanent affordability. We say we are going to develop housing affordable to households with these specific incomes. And we lay it out in great detail. So we say, say we're building a 10 unit project and we've got five one bedrooms and five two bedrooms. We tell the state exactly how many one bedrooms that we're gonna build that are affordable to a household uh, with 50% of area median income. So we're making that um, commitment right up front. So area median income, that is, uh, what LIHTC uses, what the state uses, what most of our funding sources use to define what affordable housing is. So when you think of the median, that's right in the middle. So 100% of area median income means half your population makes more money than that and half your population makes less than that. So at Downstreet, we recognize that that half of the population on the bottom is really gonna struggle to afford rents in any community, especially now. And so we build housing for generally less than 100% of area median income. Now the project that we're proposing um, in Waterbury, so what you see right now is um, area median incomes for Washington County um, and therefore Waterbury. So every year HUD, so Housing and Urban Development, uh, designates or calculates the area median incomes for counties and cities all across the country. So they come up with these numbers and we all use them as housing developers. Um, and so when we say for this project, we're proposing 50, 60, and 80% area median incomes. So these are the incomes that we anticipate serving. Now, like any landlord, we also have uh, minimum incomes that people are required to make. We want to make sure that the people in our housing are, are able to afford those rents. And those are usually, um, the way we look at that is a household can't make 
the rent can't be more than 40% of their income for them to qualify to move in. So where your market rate landlords are saying you have to make at least this much, Downstreet says you have to make at least this much and you can't make more than this. And so then HUD translates their area median incomes into the affordable rents. So these are the rents that we would, based on 2022 numbers, that we would anticipate for the proposed project in Waterbury. Um, and so some of these rents seem kind of high, actually, when I look at them and I think about, hey, my mom on a fixed income definitely couldn't move into that project. And that's because this project is designed for workforce housing. So it's for people who are earning an income um, in the community of Waterbury. Now, we don't discriminate based on source of income. So if someone comes to us and they have a subsidy, say they are retired and they're on a fixed income, but they have another way to help pay that rent, we don't turn them down because they don't have the incomes that we were looking at on the previous page. And the other thing to note about area median income and these rents is that HUD sets these rents every year. If area median income goes up, we can raise our rents. If area median income goes down, we have to lower those rents. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Nicola to talk about um, people in the community of Waterbury who might have incomes that make sense for these units. Thank you. I'm going to have to take that too. Thank you. Sorry. This is. Okay. So. We do, we have people that work in the communities do live in our apartments. So we have a couple of slides of like, just showing examples of jobs that are currently posted in Waterbury with, with their salaries of those type of employment opportunities of people based on the area median income that could live in our, sal in our buildings. So, and for example, and these are even examples taken from um, some of our other properties. So. For a licensed practical nurse, their average salary in 2021 is 54000 So at this pay, pay rate, that, that nurse could qualify for a two-person apartment at 80% area median income. So if that was a mom and a child, you know, she could live in one of our, she could live in this unit for the, one of the 80% units, area median incomes. Or if it's a three-person, uh, a, th a three person, so it was a mom and two children, and she was the only income, she was a nurse. She could qualify to live at our building. Another example is that a Vermont public school kindergarten teacher, in 2021, that salary is averaged at 60,000, 60,500. So at this pay rate, they could qualify for a two person apartment, so a, a father and child, mom and child, and live at one of our 80% units. So a little bit explaining like how that household income could fit into one of our units. So currently, so in October 10th, we went online and did some research at jobs that were posted with their salaries for Waterbury. So looking at like these types of payments, how jobs are currently posted, people could be eligible to live in, in our buildings. So for instance, a one person household, so we're proposing that this building will have 50% area median income, 60% area median income, and 80% area median income. So someone that's at 50% is one person, they live alone. They could be working, there is a job posted for a full-time grocery clerk, pays up to $16 an hour, that salary would qualify for them to live in one of our 50% units. The same as a personal shopper or a front desk service agent at a company. So that was their, that hourly rate was 14 to $18 an hour, which means for a year salary is 27,000. For a two person household, so this would be, we're looking at this as one income. So this would be an, uh, or like a, one adult, one child, or one adult, one no income adult. So they could be, um, for, for a 50% AMI area median income, it could be a healthcare access representative at $16 an hour. So that was listed for $16 to $21 an hour. So if they were at the top end range, if they were getting paid the $21 an hour, they could be, instead of one of the 50%, they could be qualified for 80% unit. So they don't have to be at the lowest pay rate. They could still be at the highest pay rate. Again, and then a mental health technician. 
So that pay rate was listed indeed for $16.92 to $26.66. This salary could fit in a 50% AMI or, a two, or up to a two-person household to 80% AMI, depending on where they're at in that income. So if they were just, we took like an average, we took $17.50 of that, $35,000 a year, that could fit in the 50%, but they could go up to 80%. And again, over here, we've got one person household for 60%. So one person income of 60%. There's three jobs that we could see could fit in one of these units. So there is a restaurant shift leader manager, which is $18 an hour. That salary is 37,000 a year. They could live, they, they live by themselves. So they could live in one of our units. A full-time beer seller associate, $17 an hour. Again, they could live single in a 60% unit. And then a full-time substitute teacher, that average salary is $30,000 to $38,000 a year. If they're by themselves, they could live in that unit. Then one person household earning up to 80%, we saw two jobs posted. There was a warehouse package handler, $21 an hour. So their salary is almost $41,000. They could live in that unit. And then a ski rental associate or a snowmaker or a lift operator, their, their salary is $20 an hour. So that's one person could live in that 80% unit. So two household people, uh, two households, so one either combined income for these, these um, jobs, it would be a one person income household. So a parent and child or two, two adults, one income. There was an auto body collision estimator for 58,000 a year, they'd be qualified to live in the, what, that unit, or a field engineer at 63,000. So we really are, look like it, this is workforce housing, and that I know is a stated need that has been said in the community. So people working and jobs that are needed in the community, um, people are eligible to live in one of these buildings. I do wanna go back to the parking uh, question. So I'm just gonna go back slides. Yes, this is the last slide. This is it. Um, thank you. Sorry. So for parking, I, just to be clear, this, I mean, this design has the, the needed, I, I don't know the exact parking spots. I could count it. But for 26 units, this is how many parking spots that we needed. I believe it's one parking spot for a studio or one bedroom. But for two bedrooms, it's one and a half. So we always make sure that we have the required zoning the required parking for zoning offered to all of our lots. Truthfully, um, and I don't 100% quote me on this, but I don't know of serious issues at any of our par at any of our properties where we don't have enough parking, except for one in Bradford. We have one in Bradford um, that is a mix of senior and family housing, and it's a tight lot that we. It wasn't new construction. It's something that we acquired, and there's not a lot of parking there. So I know there that we, there's sometimes a challenge that we don't have enough parking at that lot, but any of our other buildings in Montpelier, in Barrie, in Waterbury, we do always, the way that it works out, have enough parking spots for the residents as needed. Not all of our tenants have cars. Um, and that is, and we had a great discussion last week at the EFUD meeting that there are other units in Waterbury that either provide no parking or just one pot, one spot, and people do figure it out. But it's something that we would also work with our residents to help them with that. But that's my slide, so I could take questions okay, if I have time. You. Thank you, Nicola. We have, uh, we have just a, a couple of minutes for questions, and uh, it'd be great if you could leave this uh, sort of yeah. view up there for, um, for folks. Um, Anne. I'm Hawk. Um, South Main Street. Um, where the drive on those plans, where the driveway is exiting on Main Street, are seven utility boxes and a huge cement pad that goes down at least six feet. What are you going to do with that? So, this is, we have not engaged with engineers with the architects at this time that is a conversation and something that will be worked through again these are these are not final designs this is preliminary but those I understand why the there because of the yeah 
So that is something that we will engage with. We'll, one of the first steps after we get site control is we engage with a mechanical, electrical, structural engineer, and that is a discussion to make sure that we can fit what we can do with this site, and that's something we'll engage also with the, the town of Waterbury on to you know, relocate if necessary. And, and the utility box and the, Yes, and yeah. the utility box owners. No, exactly. Yeah. 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 Here and then over here, yeah. Cheryl Gore, um, a buzz, uh, customer. So currently, I've been reading the, the minutes, um, and this might be an EFUD question versus you, but um, you currently have a loan with EFUD that's subsidizing some of the housing you've already created. Mm -hmm. Is there anticipation that those who now pay the water and sewer fees will have to subsidize another loan for this new project? And by the way, I would like to say I'm not against the housing, it's more of a holiday for me on uh, the size of the space of the usage of it. But if, I'm just curious if you will need another loan to keep this project going. So um, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna, uh, it's, I'm sure that the project will require a variety of different financing. Um, and the, um, the financing <laughs> aspects of <laughs> something oh, of the <laughs> oh, okay. Um, the financing aspects of this um, is, is sort of beyond the scope of tonight's meeting, but I, I yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, there's 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 a um, there there is a fund um, that Bill will speak a little bit more about in his presentation. Um, yes, okay, we push that question to Bill. Yeah, yeah, that's why I said it might. Great. Be them. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, behind you, Whitney. Yeah. Oh, Robert Grace, you live in the village. Uh, I had a question about financing, so. Maybe it should be delayed. Um, if it's if it's a if it's about um, the, I, I, what's UDAG. the name of that fund? UDAG. UDAG. Yeah. If it's about the UDAG money, um, then that would be for Bill. Yeah. Okay. Um, Whitney. Uh, my name is Whitney Aldrich. I'm a UFUD customer. Um, I've lived in an apartment before that didn't have any green space. It was a second floor apartment. I know how difficult it is, especially living in a state where everybody uh, recreates and has toys like b bicycles and boats. And on sunny days, we want a barbecue, but we don't have a place to do that. Um, I guess my question to you is, how do you expect 28 units to be um, fulfilled with that need for green space? at this location, considering that the preliminary plans we're seeing is mostly parking. Yeah, so this, again, this is not our final design. You know, so things will change. That is, you know, that is something that within Downstreet's goals too, is we want to have green space opportunity for that community outside at our buildings. This is a tighter lot. It's only 0.8 of an acre. So there is, there, there, could, there can be opportunity for green space. That is something that as we move further into design that we'll work with our architect on. We also are really fortunate that there is a public park across the street and to the, a block away. And that's something, so we're knowledgeable that there is a public park close by as well for something like, this is a tight spot to offer something like a playground. But I think there's ways in the design for elements to have some sort of community space outside for the residents to be able to use. And that's something that we will, and we know that's a priority for us and we'll move forward. Can I just add to that? Yeah. You know, I know I have a second set of tires and yeah. I have my children's bikes, <laughs> all of these things. And so we are including storage to yeah. be sure that residents do have a place for that because living in the state that we live, those are important things for quality of life. So storage is definitely a priority as well. Yeah, that's, um, no, thank you, Kazai. Because that's something, especially, like, I always use the example of, I'm like, I don't want to put my snow tires, like, in my closet that's in my bedroom. So we do provide, like, additional storage inside the building for things like that, for snow tires, for bikes as well, either within the units, an additional st uh, storage unit, or in the building. So that will already be in the design and will be in the square footage, but outside space is definitely something we'll continue to work on. Thanks so much, Nicola, for um, answering all the questions and um, surviving through the technology. No problem. <laughs> Thank you to the tech team uh, over here. Uh, I appreciate that very much. Next, we're going to have uh, Bill Shuttle talk a little bit about how um, this is going to uh, impact Waterbury in terms of 
um, fees. He'll be able to answer some uh, UDAG questions for financing. The two folks who had questions about financing and the use of uh, UDAG funds there. So it's all yours. <coughs> Thank you, Teresa. I'm Bill Shepelek, the municipal manager. I live up on Ripley Road in Waterbury Center, and I've been the manager here for 35 years, um, almost. And um, I'll get to my kind of skip slide presentation from my memo here in a second, but I just want to back up for a second uh, some comments that have been made. You know, I've spent my career working in government, and the thing that I'll say that governments do is governments are typically reactive. Uh, we try to be forward thinking, proactive, we try to have zoning regulations to think about the future, but we kind of react. And when I came to Waterbury in 1988, um, many people who lived in the village, who grew up in the village, or who had moved into the village, uh, got their kids into school and they ended up moving out into the countryside. And um, as a reaction to that, uh, well, we need to preserve open space. So we're going to make five and 10 acre lots for housing. And what we've found out over time is that, well, carving up all that open space into five and 10 acre lots uses up a lot of land to house only a few people. So then after that happens, it's like, okay, well now we need to, we need to put in place uh, planned unit developments where you can take a big lot and say, well, um, you could get 50 houses on this lot uh, on 10 acres each, but we want to preserve that open space. So we, we crowd the 10 lots, the 10 houses into a smaller portion of that 50 or 100 acre lot and then uh, try to leave the rest open. So we're continually uh, shifting priorities and the kids of the people like me who moved out into the hinterlands, if you will, don't want to live out there anymore, either because they don't want to live there, they don't want to have to have a car as much, they don't want to have to rely on that, or they simply can't afford to pay a half a million dollars for, for a house. So now we're coming back into the, into the place where people are finding village life desirable. On top of that, we live in a community where 60% of the land area in Waterbury is owned by the state of Vermont in the Putnam and Mount Mansfield State Forests. Now some of that land isn't really desirable for housing anyway. You're not gonna, you know, uh, putting housing up around the Waterbury Reservoir even if you could do it, probably today isn't where you'd want to. But we've got a lot of land that's already kind of taken out of our market as far as areas to, de to develop. And even though we have 60% of our land area owned by state forest, we still have groups organizing and forming in this community that are trying to buy up open space to preserve it from development. They don't want development. So, you know, where the 60 units have been built on Blush Hill, right across the street from that, across Blush Hill Road from that, there's a, an open field that the, the EFUD commissioners spent uh, considerable time and some money to try to figure out how to get water pressure up to serve that area so that they we could serve another maybe development like those 60 units. Maybe it wouldn't be 60, maybe it would be 40. You know, you've got sewer available right at Oakwood Estates. It runs downhill by gravity. We, we've uh, figured out the problem so we can get high pressure water up to that site. But now the parcel is being sold to, the, to a land trust and it's not gonna be available for development. So we're kind of, dealing with these pressures and it's pushing any kind of development where you can have high numbers of people into the area that we're talking about. So that, that's one issue that I think uh, to help frame where we are. Um, 
to this parcel specifically, uh, in addition to being the municipal manager for the town, I'm the district utility manager for EFUD, used to be the village manager for the village before it was EFUD. Um, and EFUD's sole uh, responsibility now by their charter is to operate a water and sewer utility. And, um, you know, there's probably uh, 1,200, 1,400 water customers somewhere in that range. I'm looking at Karen, who's staring blankly back at me. Um, I'm, I'm not sure when I'm supposed to turn the page, so maybe Skip can turn. <laughs> Done covering that, you would turn the page. Okay. Um, well, I haven't got to any of that yet, so I'm not going to turn the page yet. Being subtle, Bill. Here, Skip, you, you, you turn the page when the page needs to be turned. Um, so uh, their, their, sole, their major responsibility is to operate the water and sewer utility. Um, uh, water customers, we serve water customers in Waterway outside the EFA district. Uh, we have in the charter the ability to sell water and sewer outside the uh, extraterritorial sale of water and sewer services is permitted. Uh, we sell water outside of the EFA district in Waterbury and we wholesale water to the Duxbury Moortown Fire District across the river. Um, but to have you need water if you're going to have uh, relatively dense development, but you need sewer to really have an impact in being able to, to elevate density. Um, and all of you who live in the district, you're almost 100% of the people who live in the district pay water and sewer fees. And one of the things that I'm charged to do is to try to build budgets to provide the services that we need to keep the rates as low as possible for the, the, the users while also making sure that we have adequate reserve capacity, that we have staff to respond to emergencies and to run our treatment plant. And that's getting more and more difficult. So there's pressures on the, the, the rates because when you, um, you know, somebody resigns, takes a job somewhere else, and you post a job that prior to 2020 in the pandemic, you would get 20 or 25 applications, and now you're getting four, it's, it's tough. And wages, there's a lot of pressure on wages, and there's a lot of pressure on benefits. So to, to um, balance that off, what do you need? You need more customers. You need to sell more of your product. And residential properties sell, uh, use more water and use more sewer services than just about anything else that we have, except for big industrial users like Ben and & Jerry's and when they were all working here, the state of Vermont, and maybe the school. Uh, but after all those kind of big users like that, even big commercial office spaces that have 100 people, it's 15 gallons a day. So it's 1,500 gallons of capacity that gets allocated uh, for an office as big as 100 people. And we don't have that many offices. Uh, these allocation fees, um, are they up there? Uh, yeah, so $32,550 of a water allocation fee just for these 24 to 26 apartments. Uh, you know, that's, that's 8,600 gallons of water capacity that has to be uh, sold to them. They have to pay that fee to buy the capacity. And then the sewer capacity is uh, 36,845. Um, the state tells us even though um, 8,600 gallons goes into the building, only 6,500 comes out. I don't know why, but that's what they tell us. Um, so. Those are allocation fees that I've estimated at our current allocation fee rate that Downstreet would have to pay in order to have the number of units that they propose. Now, this will be recalculated when they submit a final application, and if, if it's 24 units 
and there's more one bedroom than two bedroom than they're talking about now, that would go down. If it's more two bedrooms or more bedrooms altogether, it would go up, but that's going to be pretty close. Uh, as far as um, your quarterly bills, you all get quarterly bills. Um, Lad Hall is a downstreet property. How many units there? Anybody know? I can't remember. 25, 27. So Lad Hall currently pays about $8,100 a quarter in sewer, in water uh, fees and about $10,680 in sewer. Um, Stimson Graves Building on Stowe Street, $3,100, almost $3,200 in water and $4,100 in sewer. In the Cemetery Building in Waterbury Center, uh, they're not on the sewer system. They're paying about $4,300 of water and sewer rents. To give you a, a, you know, a comparison, um, if you look at a restaurant like Mark Fryer's uh, Reservoir, um, you know, um, uh, we have it on the books as a 136-seat restaurant in an apartment. I don't know if that's accurate anymore, but the, the quarter that ended before August 31st, I didn't do an update to this from August, but you know, that's a pretty big restaurant with a lot of seats and a lot of activity, but the water use there is $1,000 a quarter, and the sewer use is about $1,300 or $1,400. So, um, you know, Lad Hall is using um, eight times more, generating eight times more water rent than a, a, a large restaurant like that. If you have an office building, you know, the Edward Jones office building down the street, which has a dentist's office in it, which has a fairly high allocation because of it's a, a dentist's office. You know, the water bill for that uh, building, $267, and the sewer is 423 So uh, a bank like Northfield Savings Bank, $82 a quarter in water and 115 in sewer. So, you know, to, to say, um, we should put commercial properties there. I'm all for commercial properties, and I think that they have their place. But in terms of helping EFUD and helping the people who are customers of EFUD keep their rates uh, reasonable over time, which we've tried to do, uh, residential property is far and away going to provide more, um, more revenue. Uh, there's been posts and questions on Front Porch Forum. Oh, they get tax subsidies. They don't pay taxes. They pay taxes. They pay taxes on the full fair market value of the property as prescribed by state law. So they're, most of us, you know, the, the listers make an estimate and say, well, you know, the last time my house sold was when I bought it, 1996. And I bought it for 140000 And I don't know what I could sell it for, but it's much more than that. It's probably not in the tax rolls yet to the point that I can sell it because we haven't reappraised for six or eight years. But Lad Hall, right down the street here, uh, in 2022, this year, and they haven't made their second payment yet, I don't believe, but their bill for that building for municipal tax, which is the town, EFUD does not send a tax bill to anyone. EFUD is not in the property tax pay, uh, business. But Lad Hall uh, combined municipal tax to the town of Waterbury and school tax, $26,200. Um, Stimson Graves Building, on Stowe Street, $12,468. In the Seminary Building in Waterway Center, $12,496. So Dan Sweet's not able to be here tonight. He's the assessor. He could tell you the intricacies of, of how that uh, evaluation is done. For residential properties, there's an estimate as to what a willing buyer will pay a willing seller. There are other properties that are different, large commercial properties that get uh, their assessment is based on an income approach to, um, to valuation. So hotels like the Best Western and the, and the um, uh, Fairfield Inn up uh, in Colbyville. 
you know, they come in and they talk about, well, this happened, uh, the pandemic came, uh, incomes have gone down. Some of those properties had a reduction because of income uh, approach to investment. So, I mean, to evaluation. So I can't tell you exactly how the property is evaluated for tax purposes or assessed for tax purposes, but there's no, you know, significant discount provided to these folks for Downstreet. I point to these folks. They don't own the buildings. They just work for the company that does. Uh, but there's no, there's no significant discount provided by the municipality to, uh, to offset their taxes. It's assessed as Vermont law says that it has to be assessed. So um, I'll pause there. Address the questions that folks had about uh, the UDAG funds. Yeah, so the first question about UDAG over here uh, was, and, and, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but what I heard was, will the, will the water and sewer users have to subsidize this by, through a loan? And the, the, the EFUD does have a revolving loan fund. It is not the revolving loan fund does not generate any revenue from the water and sewer users. So water and sewer users are not funding the revolving loan fund. The, the, the revolving loan fund, which at the end of 2021, so January 1st of this year, the uh, total assets in that revolving loan fund were about $1.75 million. And of that $1.75 million, about a million dollars, million point two maybe, was lent out to businesses and not-for-profits in the community. And the other $600,000 or so was in uh, cash and investments. The revolving loan fund was established in 1984. Uh, the, the loan fund wasn't established in, any, in 84, but the, loan, the, the grant that the village received in 1984 was $630,000. That money was lent to Ben and Jerry's to entice them to come here and build their factory and tourism center. And uh, there was a window of about five years, I think, where their interest, in, their interest and principal were deferred. And around 1990, they started paying that back to the village. And it was a low interest subsidized rate at the time of 9% when they started paying that back. And if you remember the early 80s, like I do, you could buy CDs for 14 and 15%. And when I came to town, you know, we think it's tough now, it's tough to find a house, but it was tough to get a mortgage then because interest rates, you know, had to take a variable interest rate and gut it at 8% and I knew it was going to go to 10% the next year just because that was the deal. Um, but Ben and Jerry's paid all of that $630,000 back to the village with interest and by the time they got finished paying it back it was just shy of a million dollars, I believe, that their uh, amortization was. And then we took that money, we invested it, and if you look in the villages or the EFUDS municipal report, it's, you know, investments were made in mutual funds and bonds and, and other uh, securities, and then we used it to lend out to businesses. So uh, the Lad Hall project, uh, they, came to the community. They received, uh, I think it was about a $75,000 loan from the town of Waterbury. The town has a, it's called the CD, CDBG fund, which was uh, the genesis of that money were uh, community development block grants that help us develop Pilgrim Park. Uh, some of that was paid back to the community. That CDBG uh, grant, if you will, some of that, ha we had to send some of the returned money that we collected from the borrower back to the state so that they could use it to continue to fund other CDBG projects. But the town lent uh, money into the Lad Hall project. The town had lent money into the seminary building project, which 
the folks at Downstreet have paid that off. So that, that one is, is paid. The Lad Hall, in addition to the 70 ish thousand dollars from the town, um, uh, was it 70 or 140? I think it was 70. I, I don't have it here, but it's, uh, you know, you'll have to forgive me, and if you really want to know, I can, I can tell you. But the village had some CDBG money and lent that into the Lad Hall project. That money is a very complicated formula for how they pay the CDBG loan back to the community. In the end of the day, 30 or 40 years down the road, all of it plus interest will come back to the community. But right now, uh, they pay all of their borrowers based on a very complicated uh, formula which tries to determine how much excess cash they have. One year since we lent them that money in 2014, I think, one year a payment was made on the CDBG loans because after their audit they found out that, well, this meets the formula, so we got a small payment, very small payment. But that CDBG money will come back in the end. The village lent about $200,000 of UDAC money into the Ladenhall project, and that was at 2%. Now, if you 2% sounds like a lot less than 9% that we lent to Ben and Jerry's at, but you could go to the bank in 2014 even and get a mortgage in the 5 or 6% range. And over time, until just recently, you know, I refinanced my mortgage a couple of years ago and I'm paying 3%. So 2%, it's a, it's a lower rate than a commercial bank, but this money is basically called but for money, but for this loan at a small subsidized rate into the project, the project won't be able to go forward. So um, it's not your water and sewer rates that are right. funding the loan. I think that's the, the long answer. <laughs> hey, <laughs> have I run out of time yet? You have run out of time 12 minutes ago. Okay, no sir, no sir. The long answer to your question is, that rate payers are not subsidizing the loan. It, it was a separate loan. So, um, Bob, I just want to see, did that explanation cover your question? I'm hoping. Maybe not. I was a village trustee when the UDAG was developed. And it's, I've had this problem in my mind for a long time, and tonight is the time to tell about it. The village of Waterbury loaned Elm Street in 1991, I may not be totally right on numbers, but about a half a million dollars. <coughs> the interest on that loan was zero. Thank you, trustees. Zero. It was paid back, the, the principal was paid back in 2021. We are part of the affordable methods that they have developed to build these projects. And the only thing I would like to suggest is that the trustees or whoever the committee is, this is not, these loans are not uh, reviewed by the, by the uh, members of, of uh, the village. We have a committee that is allowed, and I do not know what their criteria is, but they are allowed to make these loans. And if we make a loan this time, please, let's, let's make it somewhat near what the bank would charge. Ben and Jerry's received that federal money, which we, which we got back in the village. They got about, uh, I think, $600,000. And we ended up with 1.2 million, which actually started the UDAG fund. And if we make decisions like that one was made, we're not going to have the money much longer. And, and one of the reasons that it's not elevated to where it should be, because it was a 30-year note to Downstreet, a loan to Downstreet for zero interest. So that's not quite right, Bob. <coughs> So there were there, there were there were two. I'm trying to, to uh, not be. Uh... <laughs> 
So, so I'm just go I'm just going to um, touch base here because what what I'm hearing you say is feedback to the people who are making the decisions about any future loans, and we don't even know if Downstreet will be applying for a loan. Um, but any feedback to the um, EFUD commissioners or the body that is making the decisions about a loan is to take into consideration your feedback. I, I'm hearing that, Bob. Yes. And, um, and we're hearing that um, the exact details might not be exactly quite right. And if, you, if people are interested in knowing the specifics of that, um, you can talk to these two gentlemen um, in a, just a few minutes, because we're getting close to wrapping up, believe it or not. Um, thank you, Bill. Thank okay. you so much for every, all of that information. Um, Great to have it. These figures and stuff are on a piece of paper over here on the table, uh, and you're welcome to take them with you so you don't have to memorize them. So now I'm going to call on Liz. Are you still here, Liz? Where else would I be? Oh, yeah. Uh, Liz Schlegel is going to uh, explain oh. a little bit about the sort of voting procedures, etc. Liz? Uh, the mic oh, is right here. Thank you. You stay up here, Karen. Oh, no. Come on. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, I am here. I'm Liz Schlegel Stevens. I live in the UDAG district, um, and I love my water and sewer. I love having it. So, uh, and I work with Karen. I am the chair of the Waterbury Board of Civil Authority, and I help Karen, our town clerk, with elections, and will be helping with this one. And so, Skip invited me here to tell you all how it's going to go. Um, what we went to mention earlier that Karen has been patiently here all night because in case anyone was confused on whether or not they lived in the UDAG district, she has the list of who lives in that district and the street that are on that district. So you can toddle back there and see her. If you are not registered to vote, please do. We have voter registration forms and you can register to vote tonight. And in fact, you can register to vote through Monday. Through November 8th, we have same-day registration in Vermont, and we love when people vote. So we're going to be voting at the fire station for this on Monday. It is an in-person meeting, which means you need to be present to vote. You can't vote at the municipal office. You can't vote the day before or the day after or the day of. It's at that meeting. Um, we are going, we think our capacity, the fire department says our capacity is 180 people hoping we won't need it all, um, hoping that people will be able to come through and come out if we don't have a long meeting. Really, this is the question on the table, right? So, um, and everybody's turned out for this great informational meeting, so it should be pretty simple. We, people will be asked to check in to vote. We're assuming that someone will call for a paper ballot, right? I just let me back up a little, right? This is a question. The question has been warned. It's just like town meeting, right? We have the question on the table. Skip will describe the question, then there will be discussion, and then the question will be called, right? So it's like a mini town meeting just for this one ballot item. And then, we, again, we are assuming that someone will call for a paper ballot. We will be set up for that. People will come, check in, just like you do on election day. We'll mark your names off, give you a ballot, and put the ballot in the box right there. Then when everybody who wants to has voted, Right? I mean, we're not going to stay there all night and run up people on the street. But when everybody who wants to has voted, we will close the poll and we will go and count them. We won't go far, probably the kitchen. <laughs> and then we'll come out and give Skip the results to announce. So that's the plan, right? And if anybody has questions, I'm happy to answer them now. What time does the meeting start? 6.30, 6 .30, right? 6.30 is the start. Can't say what time we'll be voting because we don't know. It depends on how the discussion goes. Any other questions about the process? There's yes. Is only those who are eligible to vote go to the meeting before? People can go to the meeting, but you can't vote. That's why we'll be checking people in. Right? And just like at any other public meeting, um, like at town meeting, if somebody wants to speak at the meeting and they are not a member of EFUD, they um, need to request permission to speak, and then the body decides if it's okay for somebody to talk. <laughs> right? So if Nicola was there, they would have to give her permission to talk. Any other questions 
about uh, how the meeting, yes? Uh, if there's a parent or coach or someone has a soccer game on Tuesday night, they can't be there for the informational meeting, can they come and vote afterwards? If the polls are still open, you can roll in and vote. Sure. We won't have a big sign though, so you, there's no way to know except coming in. It's a voice vote. If there is a paper ballot, it's while the paper ballot's going on. I, yeah, the, the, the thing is that this is not a defined, uh, you know, the polls close at 7 p.m., like on November 8th. Um, the, the, the polls will close when the discussion and all of the questions and any of the debate and when somebody finally calls for a paper ballot, which I expect will, after everybody in the room at that time is voted and anybody who's coming in the meantime, that's, wh that's when the vote will be closed. So we can't tell you what time that will be. Right, but it's a, to put it another way, right? Like if you got there at seven, conversation's still happening, you could vote. Yeah. Right. yeah. Yes, question. Um, I heard a few different references to days of the week. Can you just clarify the day of the week, the date and the time of the vote? Today's no. Tuesday. No. Oh, okay. No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. Sorry. Said Tuesday, it's Monday the 24th, right? Monday the 24th. At 6.30. Monday the 24th at 6.30 at yes. the fire station, the, the downtown fire station. Do not park in the fire station parking lot. Do not. <laughs> they will is, joyfully tow you. And there is an elevator for, you know, there are people here who might not have been in the fire station. There is an elevator um, in the building. And um, so just... Uh, to reiterate what Liz just said, um, the, the, you cannot pack, park in the back of the fire station. That's, that's or in front where the trucks come out. Right, Don't right. park <laughs> there either. Don't park really there. Really important. <laughs> Any other questions for Liz? And then we're going to turn it over to Skip to uh, wrap us up. <laughs> Okay. So Skip's going to review for you what the language is on the ballot so that you will know um, what it is. So while, while they're pulling that up, the purpose of tonight was so that you would be able to... Uh, Here you go, boss. Well, one, required, but two, uh, is so that you would be able to have um, faculty. I want to add is this is the article that we'll be uh, voting on to see if the voters of the Edward Farrar Utility District will authorize the district uh, commissioners to sell the eight tenths of an acre lot including improvements thereon located at 51 South Main Street in Waterbury to Down Street Housing and Community Development for the sum of $138,000 on terms and conditions acceptable to the commissioners to allow for the development of affordable housing on the site. So the vote will be yes, you agree with this, or no, you don't. Those are what you will uh, vote on your paper ballot. Hopefully on uh, Monday the 24th, we'll start at 630 the only presentation we'll probably have is from Down Street. That's the article you're voting on. If there are people come who haven't been to the informational meetings to give them a briefing on what's going to be there, like Teresa said, we'll call, somebody will call the question when they've asked all their questions and ready to vote. Um, and then we'll uh, go into the uh, balloting with the checklist and you'll go through the checklist and make sure you're a voter and get a piece of paper and um, go vote your yes or no and then we'll uh, wait and they'll come out and tell us what the uh, vote is and things. So um, that will be Monday night, hopefully shorter than this and uh, just thank you all for coming. We would have been at the fire station tonight except it's training night so we didn't want to get mixed up with the firemen. So thank you all thank for you coming. All for coming. Thank you Teresa.